Hello, BookTube. We have a little mail. Thought we'd go through a little mail together. See what we have here? What do we got? This one's light as a feather. Uh, could be a slim volume of poetry. I made uh, an explicit call about slim volumes of poetry in another video, a recent, an earlier video, uh, and got a ton of responses. Who knew that specifying a demand <laughs> would, would get the responses to come out of the woodwork? That's wonderful. Uh, I feel like I should do it again for other things. For instance... I don't have a romance reviewer. <laughs> I don't have a science fiction reviewer. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to push my luck. Uh, but anyway, let's, let's see what this thing is here. Oh. Okay, I think I requested this. Uh, uh, do I have a, a pub sheet? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, this is by Carrie Vaughn, and it is The Wild Dead. I don't have a pub sheet, so you're, you're going to have to look at my small park stars while I read this. Uh, oh, it's a... It's a Okay, I think it, this is a paperback original. Yeah, this is a paperback original. Okay, this comes out in... Uh, boy, without a pub sheet, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Okay, this comes out in late July as a $15 paperback. Uh, so I think it's worth the gamble on your part. I mean, $35 hardcover, maybe not. $15 paperback, maybe so. Uh, let's see here. A century after environmental and economic collapse, the people of the Coast Road have rebuilt their own sort of civilization, striving not to make the mistakes their ancestors did. They strictly ration and manage resources, including the ability to have children. Enid of Haven is an investigator who, with her new partner Teague, is called on to meditate a dispute between households over an old building in a far-flung settlement at the edge of Coast Road territory. The investigator's decision seems straightforward, and then the body of a young woman turns up in the nearby marshland. Almost more shocking than that, she's not from the Coast Road but from one of the outsider camps, belonging to the nomads and wild folk who live outside the Coast Road communities. Now one of them is dead, and Enid wants to find out who killed her, even as Teague argues that the murder isn't their problem. In a dystopian future of isolated communities, can our moral sense survive the worst hard times? Uh, and the, the reason that this struck me, in addition to the gorgeous cover, uh, is that the that sense of dystopian future sort of melded together with all of the worst aspects of gated communities. Uh, so I, I don't know I don't know what the prose is like, but I love the rest of it. And I love the fact that, that you could take a gamble on this. That's one of the reasons that I like paperback issues, is because you can take a gamble on them. $35, you know, that'll get you through a whole day. So it's hard to, 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 to justify popping that on a book you know nothing about. Uh, $15... You can sort of rationalize that, provided you don't do it all that often. Uh, and I'll, I will report back on this. I have a good vibe about it. Uh, so it's a good way to start this thing. Now let's let's see what this next one is. We don't have any boxes this time around. Uh, let's see. What is this next one? Oh, great. Okay. All right. Uh, I requested this. This comes out in mid in mid August, and it's a debut. Uh, and I love I love debuts. I love the feeling of the blank page. We, we don't know. We, there's no there's no reviewer on we. There's no possibility of reviewer boredom or cynicism because you've never seen it before. You might have seen the, the basic outline, the plot, that sort of thing before. And if you're unlucky, you'll have seen the turns of phrase and the cliches before. But you won't have seen anything by this author before. So it, it's fresh ground for them. You're not looking at a third novel and saying, oh, you're still on that again. <laughs> uh, this is by Delia Owens, and it is Where the Crawdads Sing. Look at that cover, Buy You at Sunset. Uh, and let's see here, Let me, since I praised the cover, I will show it to you while I tell you about this book and what, uh, what appealed to me. Let's see here. Uh, in this debut, this debut is at once an exquisite ode to the natural world, a heartbreaking coming-of-age story, and a surprising account of a murder investigation. Fans of Barbara King Solver and Karen Russell I'm getting a strong Carol Russell vibe. Um, let's see here. We'll admire this stunning novel as Owens, a New York Times bestselling nature writer, masterfully reveals the intricate beauties of nature through the eyes of a young girl abandoned by her family in the North Carolina marshland. For years, rumors of the Marsh Girl have haunted Barkley Cove, a quiet town on the North Carolina coast. She's barefoot and wild, unfit for polite society. So in late 1969, when handsome Chase Andrews is found dead, the locals immediately suspect Kaya Clark. But she is not what they say. Years earlier, when six-year-old Kaya watched her ma walk down the dirt footpath away from the family's rough-hewn wooden shack, 
tucked behind, back behind the marsh, she didn't know it would be for the last time. And then, one by one, her siblings and Pa walked away, leaving her alone with the marsh as her only provider and companion. Relying on her sharp instincts and lessons from the natural world, she builds a life of solitude away from scornful, prying eyes. A born naturalist, she becomes an expert in the ways of the marsh that teems with life and reveals its secret to the careful, watchful girl. Solitude is not easy. Yearning to be touched and loved, she is drawn to two men from town, both intrigued by her wild beauty. Each man offers different paths and promises of worlds beyond the marsh, but what lies but lies can be told, promises broken, and a tumble from an old fire tower can look a lot like murder. Uh, and that's you can see that the note that's hit over and over again in that pub sheet is the natural beauty of the marshlands, which is something I know quite well. <laughs> I don't know I don't know uh, the Carolina marshlands as well as people who live there, but I know New England marshlands like the back of my hand, and they do have a wild beauty. And the book's premise is not impossible, like the premises of so many contemporary fiction. It's not impossible. I know firsthand it is possible to live off a marsh. If you know what you're doing, it's possible to live off a marsh. They they have fresh water supplies, they have there are tubers a plenty. There's fish if you're if you're good at it. There's it's possible to do. So <laughs> so I'm cautiously optimistic. That, did I say when this comes out? This comes out in August. Uh, so we're we're two for two in terms of fiction. Let's uh, let's see see if we can't uh, mix things up with a Steve book. Hmm? Let's see. What is this next one? Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. It's still fiction. <laughs> Slightly different register of fiction. Okay, I, I I didn't request this, but I was hoping for it. Great, fantastic. Okay, this comes out in early October. <laughs> Wait till you see this. This is Dracul <laughs> by Docker Stoker and J.D. Barker. Uh, the the top author is the great grand nephew of of uh, Bram Stoker, I think. Uh, and this is well. Let me. Let, that's a very. It's a very nice design. Uh, let me see here. When Bram Stoker submitted Dracula to his publisher in 1897, he included a note to the reader stating he believed the events described in the book really happened. <laughs> and as soon as this video is over, I've got a lovely bridge in Brooklyn I want to talk to you about. I can let it go to you for nothing. <laughs> in the wake of Jack the Ripper's reign of violence, Stoker, Stoker's publishers feared London could not handle the author's claim that a supernatural beast stalked their streets. They removed the statement from the manuscript along with the first hundred pages. The only original draft of the classic novel believed still in existence begins on page 103. And no one alive has seen the original 102 pages. But what about someone who's not alive? <laughs> what, was, what was in those missing pages? With special access to Stoker's notes, texts, and various materials, I can't believe that publishers do this. Best-selling author uh, Docker Stoker, uh, I'm probably probably Daker, something like that, great grand nephew of Brown and J. D. Barker go back to Dracula's and Bram Stoker's origins in the supernatural suspense novel Dracul, the first prequel authorized by the Stoker estate. Uh, Featuring fictional characters and historical figures, Dracul follows Bram Stoker and his siblings as they hunt a dark and powerful presence from their childhood home in Ireland across Europe to a final confrontation not to be missed. Certain to be significant publishing event, Dracul is already set to hit the big screens. Oh my god! Paramount Pictures has acquired the film rights. Good lord. Okay. And it has a blurb from R.L. Stein. Uh, so this is... Uh, okay. It's set in 1868. 21-year-old Bram Stoker waits a desolate tower to face an indescribable evil. Armed only with crucifixes, holy water, and a rifle, he prays to survive a single night, the longest of his life. Desperate to record what he has witnessed, Bram scribbles the events that led him here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I am a gigantic fan of Dracula by Bram Stoker, and I am also a, a gigantic fan of Dracula pastiche fiction. I've read mountains of it. <laughs> and this is a nice, big, ambitious example of the type. So this comes out, I don't think it comes out in October when it should. No, it does. It does come out in October. 
Okay, so this is 500 pages of, of Dracula pastiche of a, a most ambitious guy. Uh, that, that business of, uh, you know, the first missing 100 pages that no one alive has ever read. <laughs> okay, all right. You, you, you might not want to spread that too thin on your toast, but still, the idea is great. And we'll see. We'll see what comes of it. The prequel doesn't star... Uh, the prequel stars the author. So that that's just fascinating. <laughs> uh, then let's see here. What have we got next? Oh. Oh, okay, great. All right. Uh, okay, this is, this is a, a new book by Paul Greenberg called The Omega Principle. It's like going funny again. Jeez, I can't get pictures on this thing at all. You're stuck with my face. Uh, seafood and the quest for a long life and a healthier planet. Uh, oh, well, it's about omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids have long been celebrated by doctors and dietitians as a key to healthy heart and a sharper brain. In the last few decades, that promise has been encapsulated in one of America's most popular dietary supplements. Omega-3s are today a multi-billion dollar industry. And sales are still growing, even as recent medical studies caution that the promise of omega-3s may not be what it first appeared. But a closer look at the omega-3 sensation reveals something much deeper and more troubling. The miracle pill is only the latest product of the reduction industry, a vast global endeavor that over the last century has boiled down trillions of pounds of marine life into animal feed, fertilizer, margarine, and dietary supplements. The creatures that are the victims of that industry seem insignificant to the untrained eye, but they turn out to be essential to the survival of whales, penguins, and fish of all kinds, including many we love to eat. Wow. Okay. Behind these tiny molecules is a big story of the push and pull of science and business, of the fate of our oceans in a human-dominated age, of the explosion of land food at the expense of the healthier and more sustainable seafood, of the human quest for health and long life at all costs. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Uh, great. The Omega Principle. Those of you who take your Omega-3 pills should be concerned. <laughs> uh, let's, let's move on here. We've just got a couple more to go. I won't, I won't make this a hideously long video. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it's my fault for asking for a Steve book. <laughs> Steve books don't get much stevier than this. This is the grand strategy of the Habsburg Empire <laughs> by A. West Mitchell. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to bother to read the pub sheet for the one or two of you out there who might be interested in the Habsburgs. Uh, but this comes out in June, I believe. This is a June release. Uh, and I've already read it. I got an advanced copy. It's quite good. Uh, uh, Yes, all right, this one's out at the end of June. I'm very happy to have a pretty finished copy. That's very nice. Uh, but we, I don't want, I, contrary to what you might think from watching this channel, I don't want to bore you to death. So I, we don't need to talk about the Habsburgs. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, here's this last one. This last one. Oh, my. Oh, my. Okay. All right. Uh, Okay, well, I've mentioned on this channel before that one of the, one of the many venues where I write is the, the Vineyard Gazette, the newspaper on, on the uh, island of Martha's Vineyard here off the coast of Massachusetts. Uh, those of you who don't know, it's, it's a, now a very popular vacation destination, and uh, the Memorial Day weekend was the starting gun. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, the, the big, fat-bottomed ferries that, that bring cars and people over to the island on a regular basis all day long, uh, all of a sudden they are disgorging millions of people instead of hundreds. And and uh, as a result, <laughs> since every single thing on the vineyard is seasonal, all of it is seasonal, it boards up and goes dead during the off months, and then it comes to life during the summer. And that also includes book coverage. <laughs> that also includes book coverage for the Vineyard Gazette. So I went through the winter scrounging and, and you know, getting a thing here and a thing there, and now all of a sudden I've got a bunch of vineyard books. And it was only a matter of time uh, until I got a book like this, and uh, it'll be a challenge. I know exactly what kind of review uh, the Vineyard Gazette wants, I, and I don't begrudge it at all. I know exactly what kind of review I would want to read 
if I had my feet up on a back porch of the vineyard. Uh, and it wouldn't be a Jeremiah. So I'm going to have to find a way to review this book without indulging in vitriol. And this is, this is by Thomas Dresser, and it is wailing on Martha's Vineyard. It's a thin little thing, and it, has, it is full of uh, archival photos. Full of them. So you have old captains, uh, old lithographs. There are pictures of all of the various implements. There are pictures of the... Yeah, there we go. Uh, there are pictures of the widows and the children who were left behind. I'm sure this will have all sorts of uh, very famous stories. Um, uh, and I will, though some of those stories are great, of course. One of them is the, one of the greatest novels of the 19th century. I will, I will find a way. <laughs> I will find a way. The people who want to know whether or not this book is worth their time are not stupid. They already know. They already know what I would browbeat them with, so that I don't need to browbeat them. It's not, not necessary to say that if you put one of those six-foot-long iron spikes inside a creature that can neuter, that can joke, that can sing in multi-part symphonies itself alone, you're doing something wrong. If you if you put an a, if you if you hurl an iron spike into that creature, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> uh, I, nobody needs me to say that. Not even you. <laughs> so I will find another way. I'll find a way. The key, the key for me will be to review this without celebrating whaling, and I think that can be done. I'd be willing to bet that even the book does that. Uh, so we, we shall see, uh, and I will definitely point, <laughs> point the results out to you. I don't, I don't let editors down, so I will find a way. Uh, so we have the grand strategy of the Habsburg Empire. <laughs> they had one, you know. <laughs> and then uh, whaling on Martha's Vineyard. The Omega Principle, the dark side of Omega-3, the fat of Omega-3 pills. Then uh, Dracul, a prequel to Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, by a many-generational sequel to Bram Stoker himself. <laughs> uh, then Where the Crawdads Sing, a novel about a marsh girl that's also going to be in large part, it sounds like, a lyrical evocation of the beauty of marshes in general, which is great. And The Wild Dead. A uh, strange-sounding kind of dystopian thing. Sounds very limited in scope. Uh, no scorch trials, no nothing like that. But it sounds like it could be really good. Uh, so I, this is this is a fantastic mail haul. It, uh, virtually every part of it intrigues me. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to wrap this up for now and go poking around in these things. But I will see you soon. Thank you, Book Two.